In this lecture, we're going to review some of the theories of social development. And so these are the theories that attempt to account for how children's development is affected by the people and social institutions around them. So this is something that should have become very familiar to you already, um, because this is something that uh, every Psych 101 class should attempt to cover at the, uh, at, at the very least. And so these theories are the, basically, they try to account for the account for many important aspects of development, including emotion, personality, attachment, self, peer relationship, morality, and gender. And now why is it all kind of lumped together under social development? And, and this is because uh, when it comes to like the social development, this is uh, the primary way of how we really kind of understand ourselves in, in relation to other people and also how other people um, view us. Now, when it comes to the actual school of thoughts, there are uh, four major school of thoughts. Okay, so there is the psychoanalytic. Uh, most of you guys know this um, as the, the founding father of psychology, basically, uh, Sigmund Freud. And then there is the learning aspect, and there's the social cognitive, and then there's the ecological aspect, um, school of thoughts, basically. And then, uh, and there are three prevailing themes that uh, you will see throughout. Okay, so the first one is, of course, the individual difference. Uh, so as we examine how social world affects children's development, and the next one is the nature versus nurture. You'll try to see that what aspect is really trying to kind of emphasize uh, uh, the, the genome effect, the genetic effect, and how environmental factors kind of cross link between these two. And then the last theme is the active child. And that is basically, this is also a major uh, focus. Uh, some of the theories really emphasize children's active participation participations in their own like socialization. So in other words, um, th in this view is kind of see uh, does a person's free will really try to and can kind of shape their own destiny uh, as they are kind of trying to influence their own will onto their environment and onto the way that they really um, kind of destined themselves to be. Now let's first talk about psychoanalytic theories. And the people who belong to this school of thought is of course the founding father of Sigmund Freud uh, for psychoanalysis and also his successor, Eric Erickson. Now they both believe that development of children is predominantly driven by the biological maturation process or processes, okay. Uh, now, for Freud, he believed that these processes are mostly unconscious or subconscious, whichever word that you, you use is fine, uh, meaning that the children is often unaware of this process and they kind of just progress uh, just based on the age, okay? Now, for Erickson, his uh, idea is slightly different that he believed that the development of children of the psyche is really driven by a series of developmental crises related to age and maturation. And now in order to achieve um, proper development of uh, a person's psychological makeup, then the individual must uh, successfully resolve these crises. Okay, and then you see that this idea was not novel. Um, this idea actually came from uh, like uh, some of Freud's idea in the which that when uh, some stage, if the if, if at some stage that is not actually not resolved, there are complexes that's formed, and then these complexes can actually influence you or influence a person's life, uh, influence their behavior and the, the way of thinking, and this can really um, become a, a source of detrimental uh, aspect when it comes to the makeup of the psyches. Now, before we go on and talk about Freud's theory of psychosexual development, uh, let me first 
go back a little bit and talk about basic rhodium terminology. And this is basically the three layers of personality structure. So that consists of id, ego, and superego. And this is something that I'm sure you guys should know. So id is the most primitive personality structure. This one is the earliest one to develop. And so this, um, it operates mostly subconsciously, and then its main goal is to seek pleasure, okay? Now, ego, this is the second personality structure to develop. This is the rational, logical, problem-solving components of the personality. And the third one is the superego. This is the third personality structure to, to develop. And so this is the part that is kind of like the criticizing the moral aspect of the self. This one is the latest one to develop. So when you kind of trying to look at what is id, ego, and superego, and, and super, super ego in terms of the conscious level, it kind of looks like this. Uh, so you can see that id is completely operating underneath uh, the conscious level. So they call this either the subconscious or the unconscious level. Okay, so as we said, id is the basic impulse, sexual, sex and aggression, seeking immediate gratification. It's irrational, it's impulsive, and it operates on an unconscious level. Now, the superego and the ego the superego is more dealing with like the pre-conscious level and because it doesn't really allow itself to come out that much of the time unless you are like a complete saint. Um, but the superego, these are like the ideals and morals. And so this is striving for the perfection uh, incorporated from the parents and then this becomes the, the, the person's conscien conscience. Okay, so that's really good, liangxing, conscience. Okay, and then this operates mostly on the pre-conscious level. Okay, and the ego, of course, uh, is operating on the both pre-conscious as well as a conscious level. And and when you kind of think about it, uh, ego it is really kind of making contact with both id and superego. So the ego really is like the mediator between the superego and the id. Okay. And then the, what the main job for the ego to do is really to execute the mediating between um, both of these um, superego and id. And then it operates mainly on the conscious level, but then sometimes it can be on the pre-conscious level as well. Now, if you, are, if you want to simplify this a little more even, what you can do is look at this next graph. The id is kind of like the devil in you, okay? It's the instincts. It wants immediate gratification. The superego is like the angel in you, okay? And then so you can see that um, one is on the left and one is on the right, and the ego is the one that's kind of caught in between. So uh, do you, have, have you guys watched the, the movie, The Italian Job? I know that was a long time ago, but then... Uh, I think the guy asked him, don't, don't you trust me? And then, and then the girl says, well, I trust you. I just don't trust the devil in you. Okay, so that's what um, she was saying. Uh, I, don't, I, I do trust your ego or your super ego. I just don't trust your id, you know, because that's the devil in you and uh, God knows what you're going to do, right? So, and I have to say that um, we all have a certain number of uh, different percentage of these makeup. Some people have a stronger superego, some people have a stronger ego, and some people just have a stronger id. But this is all, we all have a part of this within us, uh, according to Freud, and it just um, people, personality are just slightly different, um, de determining by, the, uh, determined actually by the amount of the kind of uh, immersion that this person is going through at a very specific uh, stages in his uh, psychosexual developmental stages. Now let's talk about Freud's psychosexual developmental stages. Now we're all born with id, so that happens even before the oral stage. So the oral stage starts to emerge 
around one years of age. Okay, and then this is the stage where um, the ego develops. Now, what is the world stage? It is uh, called this because the primary source of gratification and pleasure is oral activity, such as sucking on the pacifier, sucking on the mother's nipple for milk, and also eating. Okay, now for Freud, the baby's feeling for his or her mother are unique. And through them, the mother is established uh, you know, as a whole time life and the first and strongest love object and as the prototype all for all later love relations. So basically, which kind of makes sense because uh, it is the first person that you have ever known and, um, and you live inside your mother for a very, very long time. So uh, you can kind of see where before I get this idea. Okay, now something I, else I want to bring up, and that is uh, after the oral stage, then comes uh, after that is the anal stage. Okay, so this happens during infant's second year. Uh, so the maturation facilitates the, 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 the development of control over some of these body uh, processes, including uh, peeing and also going to the bathroom, um, so go, going poo-poo, okay? So this is the anal stage, okay? Now, when things goes wrong, you know, then this person can become very controlling. So uh, a lot of time you hear uh, people saying that you are anal retentive. Uh, that means that they're having an issue. This is what Freud kind of says that this is when the thing kind of go wrong during the uh, anal stage. Okay, now, now the next one is the phallic stage and this spans from ages of three to six years old. Uh, now in this stage, the focus of sexual pleasure again um, kind of goes and then they kind of become interested in their own genitalia. So like the penis and the vagina, well, and also the clitoris. And so all of these uh, stuff, okay? And, and, and around this time, the children will all also be interested in not just their own body, but the body of another person. Um, so now, Freud believed that during this phallic state, children identify with their same sex parent. Okay, so giving rise to the gender differences in attitude and behavior. Now, he also believed that young children experience intense sexual desires during the phallic stage, and he proposed that their efforts to cope with them leads to the emergence of the third personality structure, which is the superego. Now, and we talked about what, what the superego is already. So the superego is basically like the conscience. And this is based on the internalization of the parent's standard and the acceptable, uh, acceptable behavior. And what the superego does is that it really um, is kind of like the angel uh, voice or like the God's voice, the, the, the part of you that's always kind of critical of yourself, the part that's always telling you no, that's the part that's always kind of controlling um, that aspect, okay? And on top of that, uh, the path to superego uh, development is through like the resolution of the Oedipus complex with the Electra complex. So Oedip Oedipus complex is, of course, a boy having crush on his mother and Electra complex is the, the other way around, a girl having crush on his uh, on her dad. Uh, so in Chinese is Lian Mu Qing Jie, Hayo Lian Fu Qing Jie. Okay. Uh, so what happened is that during this period it's uh, so if, if the what happened is that if they were able to overcome the Oedipus with the Electra complex, then uh, the issue is that they can have a uh, they can have a development of the super ego that is something that is more softened and then does not and will not always be kind of critical like on themselves because 
Um, now, if they do not overcome the Oedipus with the uh, electro complex, then the main issue of that can really be, well, according to Freud, by the way, I, I don't think that's the case, um, can be pretty detrimental because uh, he or she would never get over the idea that uh, I have a uh, electro complex or I have an Oedipus contract, uh, complex, and therefore um, the kind of uh, mate that they will always look for are going to be kind of reminiscent of their mother or father. But of course, that goes a, a lot deeper than that. Um, because for a person kind of get the, the complex uh, stuck in this phallic stage, they do not fully develop into the later two stages in the latency period as well as the genital stage. And that is why, uh, according to Freud, they really have an, an issue looking for uh, like made around the same around the same age. Okay. Okay. Now the next one is the latency period, and so this spans from age six to eleven. So latency period basically this is the time of relatively calm. So the the sexual desires they are pretty much hidden away. So this is the period. Uh, you would hear from kids that, oh, girl, uh, girls are gross, or oh, boys are gross, or, or like, or if the, um, what would uh, very often, like, if they see their parents start kissing, they'll say, oh, please, you know, I don't want to see that. Um, so these are usually the kids that are in the latency period. Okay, now let's go to the last stage, and that is the genital stage. This begins with the, the, the advent of sexual maturation. So the sexual energy has kind of begun to become in check for several years. Uh, they start to re-exert itself with, uh, with full, um, full force. And so basically, this is um, when puberty starts to go. So you can see that the latency from, this goes from sex to puberty. All right, so this is when the libido which, by the way, is sexual energy, just another word for sexual energy. So this is when the, when the libido is actually inactive. And the next part, the genital stage, starts from puberty to, well, I personally don't think that it goes to death. I personally think that kind of goes to menopause. But, but according to Foy, sexual energy equals life energy. Okay, so this is something that uh, without sexual energy, uh, you cannot stay alive, uh, uh, according to uh, him, as, as well as some of his later followers, such as Carl Jung, really think that sexual energy really is um, equivalent of life force. And, and you see this in a lot of other cultures as well. I think in Hindu, uh, they also kind of feel that uh, uh, sexual energy and the pranic energy is kind of one and the similar. Well, I don't say they're exactly the same, but then you can kind of somewhat equate them, you know. And then in Chinese, we call them qi. But then, you know, the sexual energy can be transferred to uh, some sort of uh, qi. And then, you know, I think in, in Chinese medicine, we do kind of feel that the way that um, uh, we call the kidney Qi, right, Shen Qi, and then that a lot of it has to do with um, sexual energy as well. And then so this is uh, in Chinese medicine, a lot of uh, people kind of feel that um, when you, let's say, uh, spend too much of your sexual energy, um, then your kidney is not doing so well. And then because in, in the Chinese medicine, um, kind of think that sexual energy kind of equates to uh, what we call xian tian zhi qi, right? So this is something that um, we do see a lot of parallel um, between Freud's idea and some uh, other ancient culture, and that has been really kind of went on over the years, uh, over the centuries, uh, if not millenniums, right? Now let's take a look at some of the fixations. Fixations are things that has not been fully resolved during that specific time and or a specific developmental stage. So you can see that the oral fixations, if there are 
issues with uh, some sort of complexes that was not addressed fully with this, well, or was not solved fully during the world or during the world stage, you can see that this person may, may engage in bad habits such as smoking, gum chewing, or nail biting. Okay, so this these are the things that kind of needs to be addressed for a person's psyche to reach equilibrium. Same thing for um, the anal fixations. Okay, so if things went wrong with the anal fixation, uh, we in English we when we say that someone is uh, controlling, we just need things to be an absolute um, way that just completely perfectionism. We usually call it anal retentive. Okay, so this is a di exact direct word coming from people that is like a Freudian believer. Okay, so what the the anal retentive people who are going to be um orderliness and then they're very com compulsive or or obsessive about like very every little details and they are they really focus on things like perfectionism. And then their rigidity, they're very stubborn, they won't yield to anything, okay? Uh, now, if there are any issues during the phallic uh, stage, then this person might engage in things like um, paying too much attention to the way that they look. You can see vanity over here. They might uh, like love to show off their body ex ex uh, exhibitionism. So if you go to people uh, let's say uh, if you go to let's say France where where there are, there are new nudist beaches, uh, they just love to showing their body just re even when they don't have the the actual body to show them off. Um, well, they have some sort of stuckness. They have some sort of complex in their during their phallic stage, or even something like pride. You know, uh, so you can see that not necessarily. It's it's not necessarily going to be vanity exhibitionism or pride, uh, but a lot of these things they can they can kind of express them from one way or the other, depending what your culture allows. Okay, so in China, what we see is that um, while you might not get so much exhibitionism because there are no very very little venues that allows this. It's not like we have like nudist beaches in China, right? At least I, I'm not aware of them. Um, but a lot of um, people, they might be uh, getting a little bit too much on the vanity. Um, they, they spend three hours getting their makeups done and then, or, or something like pride, um, they must get a, a trophy in every competition that they have ever com uh, participated in. So that's also another type of fixation. All right, now let's talk about Eric Erickson, uh, and he is one of the many followers of Freud, and he really has a great influence in developmental psychology. Uh, so basically, Erickson accepted the basic element of Freud theory, but kind of incorporated the social factor into it, including like the cultural influences. And, and on top of that, he also expanded it to a much more lifespan development. Okay, so these are his stages. It goes from uh, infancy to toddlerhood all the way to late adulthood. So you can see that this is much more lifespan compared to Freud, because Freud's developmental period, if you go back, it basically ends in adulthood, right? And so when we look at Eric Erickson, he really take factors in everything in terms of uh, a person's development all the way from when a person just been born all the way to um, like in the 60s and beyond, okay? 60 years old and beyond, I mean, yeah. Okay, let's go over each and every stage of Eric Erickson's uh, stages, okay? So the first one is infancy, and the age is um, under one or two years. So, and the virtue that they have hopefully obtained at this age is hope. Okay, and the crisis that can uh, really arise from this point is trust mis versus mistrust. Okay, and so in other words, it's kind of like 
Do they trust the world? If they do not trust the world or if they mistrust the world, then they are really going to have an issue when it comes to their entire life development. Okay, now the significant relationship during this age is going to be their mother, okay? And the existential question really comes is, can I trust the world? Uh, can I exist in this world? Uh, am I wanted in this world? In other words, okay? The next stage is toddlerhood, and this goes from age from one to four. And the virtue that they must learn is will. Will meaning like a, a will to live in the world, okay? Now, the psychosocial crisis that they can really have uh, at this stage is autonomy versus shame and doubt. Okay, now what do we know about this? Well, so the challenge for the child is really is to achieve a strong sense of autonomy while adjusting to the increasing social demands. And so this is kind of going beyond for its focus on toilet training. Erickson also pointed out during this childhood, this period, the dramatic increase that occurs in every realm of children's real world competence, including motor skill, cognitive abilities, and language, they really foster the, ch the children's desire to make their own choices. Now, at this toddlerhood, uh, they have like newfound ability to explore the environment. That's something that we talked about, right? And this is going to change the family dynamics. And this is going to initiate long running battle of will with uh, caregivers, okay? So you can see that this is the virtue that the toddlerhood must obtain, that, that, that they must gain this in order to advance to the next stage. And the significant relationship is going to be with the parents, as you can see. And if the parents provide the supportive atmosphere that allow children to achieve self-control without the loss of self-esteem, children, they can gain a sense of autonomy. Now, by contrast, if children are subjected to severe punishment or ridicule or uh, just yelling or shouting just because they were doing something, uh, then they may become doubtful of their abilities and then therefore they become dependent everything on their, their parents and then they do not become autonomous later on in their life. Okay, so you can see that the existential question at this point is that, is it okay to be me? Is it okay to do what I want to do in the world and not be restricted by my parents? The next developmental stage is early childhood, and this goes from ages um, four to six. And the virtue that they must obtain is purpose. So what do we mean by purpose? Well, it actually means that the child should be constantly setting goals in either um, playing with something or in school and work hard to achieve them. Okay. Now, if they do not initiate enough and uh, achievement of those goals, then what happens is that they can develop guilt for not achieving those goals. Okay. And at this stage, uh, Erickson believed that the crucial attainment is the development in conscience. And this is very similar to Freud's idea because in Freud's idea, this is the stage where superego develops, right? And then so the challenge for the, the child is really to achieve a balance between initiative versus guilt. And the significant relationship that they have is actually the one with their family. And the existential question that they usually have at this stage is, is okay for me to do, move, and act. Now, if they do not follow through with their own desires in this stage, then what happens is that they will feel guilty for not following through and achieving and satisfying this kind of goal setting to kind of satisfy this desire that they have. Okay, so it's really important for uh, children at this stage to really develop a very strong desire and also a very strong initiative and a burning desire to act, uh, act on their wishes. 
Okay, now let's talk about middle childhood, and this is basically the same as the elementary school years from six to puberty, okay? And the virtue that they must obtain is that of competence, right? The competence part is when you kind of think about that, this stage is really crucial for ego development, and the children, they really start to master the cognitive and social skills that becomes important in their life, and then they learn to work industriously and cooperate with peers. So successful relationships and successful experiences can really give the, the children a sense of competence, okay? And then the failure to do that, they can really leave them a sense of inferiority because they will feel that I am never as good as some of my classmates. So you can see that the significant relationship that they have during this stage is really the one with community, especially with their classmates or the, their friends and or their neighbors that, that the school and, and in the school. So the, basically the people who are kind of in their same age. Okay? And the existential question that they have is usually, can I make it in the world of people and things? And because because when we kind of think about it, this is the first time that they are really um, when work really counts, okay, in 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 elementary school, okay, and then can they make make it in the world of people and things? Now let's talk about the next stage, uh, the adolescence, okay. So this goes from puberty to nineteen years of age, and the virtue of that is fidelity. Uh, okay, so Erickson really thought that this stage is very important, seeing that this is a critical stage for achievement of a core sense of identity, okay? So he thinks that if you can identify yourself amongst your peers, then this makes you who you are for a great part later in your life. Okay, but if somehow during this stage there is some sort of role confusion that you're not so sure who you are, you're not so sure what is your purpose in the world, and you're not so sure a kind of what kind of person you want to be, this can really have a very bad repercussion when it comes to uh, your whole life uh, later on. So you can see that. And this is, of course, attributed to um, the dramatic physical changes during puberty and also the, the, the starting in emergence of strong sexual desires. And, and this all kind of have a very strong, uh, create a, a new social pressures, including the need to make educational and, and occupational decisions, right? So when you kind of think about this is really like a, an age of becoming, a, right? So this is a, an age of becoming, you are first learning about your new body, so to speak, because there is a huge growth spurt physically, right? And then this is the, for a very first time, you kind of start to reach sexual uh, maturity. So you start to not just only identify with um, your own peers in the same sex, but you also start to identify with your peers in the opposite sex. And then there are going to be sexual attractions um, at this stage, very strong ones as well, because all this all of these new hormones that are being produced by your body. And so you can see that uh, there is going to be a lot of things that kind of caught in between. And, and there are also a lot of issues if um, because you are not a child anymore and then it's kind of forcing you to grow up. And then so there are a lot of issues um, really comes to that can really come from this stage, okay? And you can see that the significant relationship that um, during this stage really is peers and role models. Now, if you are able to gain um, role models, if you have a good role models, you see, let's say you see someone's story online or in a movie where uh, you have a very good role model 
uh, in your family, let's say maybe your cousin became a, a doctor where your, um, uh, where your little uncle is like a lawyer or something like that. And you, and you thought that, oh, I want to be just like him. Uh, so you can start to um, copy or modeling from this person and then really try to become the person that you always wanted to become at this stage. So the existential question that came from here really is who am I and who can I be in the future? And this is this really is the point that when you set set it up, then you can go on and pretty much finish uh, your life from here. Okay, now let's go on to the next stage, and that is early adulthood. Now, the your book pretty much ended in the last one. Okay, but I feel that since this is a developmental class, I really want to give you like the 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 most complete version of Erickson's uh, psychosocial developmental stages. So this goes from 20 to 39, and the virtue that they must uh, try to obtain is love. Okay, now, so this is, th this is the picture of uh, guys at wedding, okay? So, and so the crisis that uh, a person can really have at this stage is intimacy versus isolation. And can the person love another person, all right? And because if he or she has not gained enough um, adequacy in the previous stages, they might feel very inferior, or not good enough, or not complete enough, and therefore, they cannot properly share their life with another person, okay? And then, so this is why uh, it's kind of like intimacy. So if they can learn to be intimate with another person, and that would be great, of course. And if they can't, then they're bound to spend this uh, age in isolation, of course, right? So the kind of significant relationships are, uh, are going to be friends and partners, okay? A uh, partner could be spouses or it could be girlfriend and boyfriends and things like that. And the existential question is, of course, um, can I love? Am I loved? Okay, and of course, this is why when you kind of think about it, the, the romantic movies, the big sellouts are always uh, the people who go to see this are usually couples or the people who are in this age uh, that are single. Now let's talk about middle adulthood and this goes from age uh, 41 to 60 and the virtue is care. Okay, now when you think about it, this is when a person who, uh, who whose career is at its highest, okay, uh, he's very productive, uh, in society, he's working a lot and probably uh, generating a lot of money. And then, so the caring is really caring for the family, caring for maybe the parents, and definitely caring for the children at this point, and also taking care of other people. And so the uh, the psychosocial uh, uh, crisis can really arrive from this point is uh, generativity versus stagnation, okay? Can you kind of contribute to the world or are you not contributing to the world, in other words, okay? So the significant relationship that can go from that really is uh, household and workmates. Now, I want to just say that, so this is why you see that men in their 40s and the 50s are typically kind of really emerged in their work life, okay? And because when you kind of think about it, their existential question is this, can I make my life count, okay? Can I really contribute to the world um, or my family? Can I have had contributed enough? Okay, the last stage is late adulthood and this age 60 and after. So the virtue that they must obtain at this point is wisdom. Now, the psychosocial crisis that they have is integrity versus despair. So what do we mean by integrity versus despair? Okay, so 
if a person has uh, been very successful up to this point and then get into late adulthood, their life should have been um, the one with integrity, okay? Because they have done everything that was truthful to their heart. They have really faced all the crises, crises that they, they could have, and then therefore they have no regret in their life. And then as opposed to if there were a few things that they really felt that they were, they, they were having issues with and then they, they didn't listen to their heart and they have regrets over their life. And then at this stage, um, because at this stage, uh, uh, this is a key word here and that is reflection. A lot of people at this stage, they're reflecting on their own life, okay? And if there are regrets of something that you should have done, for instance, um, oh my God, I should have um, gone after that deal when that was 40 years old, I would have been so much richer now. I would have a such comfortable uh, retirement. That's a regret, okay? So with something like, I wish I did not cheat on my wife. Now, uh, now I don't have any children and then she left me and then and she took all my money. Okay, that's another regret, okay? And then another things like, uh, things like, I wish I did not work so hard in my life and now because I have neglected my uh, relationship with my uh, with my children, and now they uh, they don't even, they, they they don't come to see me very much, and say that's another regret. And then all of these regret is going to cause you to live in despair. Okay, so so this is the things that you're going to have to face when you are sixty years old when you are doing reflection. Now, just give uh, let me just paint you a picture. Imagine that you are. Uh, watching the sunset in a rocking chair and then reflecting back on your life. Do you want your life to be something like, you know what, I did everything that I could in this life and I have no regret. If I have to live my life all over again, I would have done exactly the same thing as I have. I really had a, a really fantastic life. If do you want that kind of life or do you want the kind of life like I just said, I default of despair, I should have done that, I should have done that, I should have done that, I can't believe I did not do that. That is going to cause you to live in despair. Okay, so the point I'm trying to make is that you, uh, you guys are still young, so you want to live a life in which that you are truthful to your heart. And even when you are facing opposition from other people, you should do the things that you think is right. And of course, without breaking the law, okay? And then, so you want to do the things that, that you think is right because you don't want to get to a point when you are 60 uh, and you're sitting in the rocking chair watching a sunset and you're full with regret, you know? So this, this is uh, the things you don't want to live. Right. Now, the relationship in um, late adulthood is no longer compared to like friends and family and stuff like that, but I'd rather at this point is the mankind and the rest of the world, basically. And the, the kind of question is it's a little sad, but, but when you kind of think about it, it really is true. Is it okay to have been me? Okay. Was I truthful to myself this entire life? Um, did I do everything that I could to live a fantastic life? So these were the life that, so this it is the question for um, late adulthood. Now let's talk about developmental learning theories. So this is the school of thoughts from the empirist philosopher John Locke, who believed that experience shapes the nature of the human mind. So he turned this uh, tabula rasa, which is a um, blank sheet, okay, as you can see here. And then what happened is that he had this idea that children are born as blank sheets and then the life experiences form who they become as adults. So this is uh, obviously, as you can see, the nature versus nurture. John Locke is obviously the nurture camp, okay? and the people who follow his ideas, such as uh, Watson, Skinner, and Bandera, so these are the people who really thought that experiences is the reason 
that means people who they are as adults and then not so much with the nature part it's so you can say this is a direct contrast compared to freud and erickson okay so we're going to talk about um behaviorism social conditioning so, sorry social learning and we're not going to talk that much about operant conditioning because this was covered already in the previous lecture so um i'm going to just talk about watson and bendera um, for this lecture Okay, let's talk about John Watson first. He's the founder of behaviorism. And he really believed that development is, de is determined by child's social environment. And then they do this from learning and through conditioning. So you can see that they basically are going to associate something with a happy thoughts with something with fearful thoughts, something like that. Okay, and Watson really believed that psychologists should study the behavior, not the mind. He is not a believer of um, the inner mind working. He really believed that the things that we can only study are the visible and measurable behavior from people. And now the most famous uh, experiment that he did was um, this one called little albert experiment okay so what he did is he first exposed little albert to a perfectly nice white uh, white rat in the laboratory and so what happened that albert reacted positively to the uh, rat but then in the subsequent exposures however the researchers start to pair the presentation with the rat with a very uh, loud noise that really frightened uh, albert and so you can see that this is going to um, create something very fearful for little Albert, okay? And then, then what happened is that now little Albert is actually scared of the rat. And because little Albert has now associated something, a negative uh, stimulus with something that was neutral before which was the rat okay and so there is a very specific name for that and that is called fear conditioning okay so you can see that this kind of study it would be not be uh would not be ethical to do now on humans but uh, i think back in john watson's days uh it was okay um because the restriction on the guidelines was not so so much then okay and so basically John Watson was able to demonstrate that you can go through a series of conditioning and make something that was previously neutral or even positive and you can turn that around and you can um, pair that with something that is a very negative uh, outcome so if you pair the rat with a loud sound which makes uh, the, the little Albert Frightened, and then all of a sudden they start to see the rat as something that is also dangerous or threatening to them. Okay, now is this effect reversible? Yes, it is. Okay, so th it's done through uh, something called deconditioning, uh, or you can maybe see it as extinction. Okay, so this is a student of Watson's. Uh, who is, uh, his last name is Jones, and he treated a two-year-old guy, um, well, two-year-old little guy called Peter, and who was very scared of white rabbits before. And then to decondition Peter's fear, the experimenter first gave um, him his favorite snack, and then as Peter ate this favorite snack, then would start to um, start to present the white rabbit. And then you can see that there is a process called systematic desensitization. I'll write it down here. Systematic desensitization. And this is actually was able to get rid of or at least help Peter come over his uh, phobia with the rabbit to the point that uh, Peter was actually able to pet the rabbit. 
So what was Watson's view on development? Well, first of all, he believed that the sole responsibility on the proper development of the child is on the parent. So in other words, if the children are not developing properly, it is completely the parent's fault. Okay. Now, the second thing he kind of recommended is that there should be a strict feeding schedule for the baby. So this way, the baby with the infants would kind of expect feeding at regular intervals and then will, they won't cry for attention. Now, this really has some um, repercussions, and but it kind of fell apart after Spock's um, The Common Sense Guide for Baby and Child Care was published in uh, 1946, I believe. Okay, but after that, now you can see that Watson's emphasis on the development is still like a very key factor. So for the people who kind of succeeded after him, uh, people such as Skinner and Bandura, these are the people who really had, um, really kind of paved their ways to kind of believe that learning is a definitely a very uh, important issue and the fact that experience dependent um, really, really guides and shapes the development of the um, psyche and that can be uh, measured by a, a bunch of behavior. Okay, now let's talk about social learning theory and the most famous person that belongs in this camp is really Albert Bandura. And you can see his picture on the right. And now, social learning theory also focuses on the learning mechanism as a way that shapes the development of the child, but they actually focus more on the social learning aspect. Okay, so, so they do this through modeling and imitation. So then what happens is that when you give someone, like a child, a reward, they, this can really increase their modeling and the amount of the imitation. And you can also call this um, observational learning. So you can just watch someone do something and then you can learn that, okay, I can do this myself. Okay, so it's kind of uh, when a child is watching his dad, uh, let's say, open the door and later on he can say that, oh, I can do something that's very similar. Now, later on, you can see that Bandura uh, changed a little bit of his approach, and he did not just become like a pure social learning guy, but he later on, he called his um, theory social cognitive theory, okay? Social cognitive theory. So what happened, he then believed that there are mechanisms that are involved within the learning aspect that is really becomes an important aspect because we're doing um, observational learning over here, right? So he first believed that the first step is attention, paying attention to something, and then then uh, they, they, the children who are trying to learn this need to encode it into their brain. And after that, there is a storage part, and then there is the retrieval. So his idea is, is very it's kind of different from Watson because Watson is just really only believing uh, in the retrieving right, which is the part that is observable that is produce a very specific behavior. But um, Albert Bandura is actually really believing um, the predecessing steps that uh, uh, the president steps that kind of come before the behavior. So he is going more into the psychological process or the cognitive processes that are behind the actual uh, behavior that is supposed to be seen, okay? And he also, he also kind of um, believed that there is something called the reciprocal uh, determinism. And so this is, is emphasizing that on the active child as well. So this is a concept that basically there is child environmental um, influence that happens both directions. So children are affected by aspect of their environment, but they can also influence the environment. So you can see that uh, his idea is much more uh, in 
in uh, concert with what we are thinking about in terms of uh, the learning processes and how the perception can really um, of the environment can produce an observable uh, result and motor outcomes and then can also then influence the environment and so forth. All right, now you cannot talk about Albert Bandura without talking about his famous Bobo doll experiment. So basically, uh, this Bobo doll experiment is when they have a bunch of children watch a uh, experimenter here and basically just beating uh, the hell out of this doll. Okay, and later on, you, you, you'll see that the child who watched this film would do exactly the same thing here. They start to beat the crap out of this bubble doll as well. Okay, now the girl underneath here who did not watch the film then did not actually participate in such um, beating up process. But then she started to do that when was offered a reward to do so. Okay, so what this means is that uh, when child watch something that their parents do, then they will remember that and then they will do something that is very similar, if not exactly the same thing. Okay, so this is what um, the Bobo Dog experiment is trying to say, that we learn um, by watching other people's behavior and then we would tend to do exactly the same thing. Okay, now having talked about Albert Bandura, then this is a really good time to go into the social cognition developmental theories. Uh, I'm not going to spend that much time on it because we still have a whole lot to talk about when it comes to the ecological theories of development later. Um, so uh, basically what I want to emphasize is that the central theme for this group of people uh, they really focus on the active child and individual differences. And they really focus this on things like male versus female, the aggressive versus non-aggressive type, the extrovert versus the introvert kind of kids, right? So they really focus on what is the role of the cognitive process. And you can see that this, they kind of take directly after what uh, Albert Bandura has left off. And then so really kind of focus on how attention to the environment, the previous knowledge about the environment, their reasoning about what are the reasons behind their actions and attribution when it comes to what uh, properties that attributed the scenario with and then kind of and also the explanation uh, what all of these things they can collectively to do on child's development. Now, there are three main people in this camp, and I'm just going to very briefly talk to, to um, talk through them. And so Salmons kind of believes that children go through stages in terms of their ability to appreciate what uh, that different people do different things. And Dodge kind of uh, kind of uh, kind of suggest that study, he studied like a lot on aggression and that emphasized children's interpretation of other people's behaviors. And then there's is also um, Dweck, who is like a more like a theory of achievement and motivation and kind of see that the children's response to their successful theory depends on whether they attributed the outcome to their effort or their ability. So in other words, if they feel that, okay, I failed because I did not uh, contribute that much. That is, has nothing to do with my ability. That just has to do with my faith, uh, with my effort. Okay, now as opposed to if they kind of failed and then they, they knew that they really have uh, contributed a lot of their effort, they might start to kind of doubt themselves and say, okay, maybe this is my ability that I'm not smart enough. Uh, I'm not capable enough to achieve all of these things. So you can see that this is kind of more like the social cognition because you can have exactly the same outcome in this case as a failure, okay? Um, and But then they can either contribute to, to their effort or their ability. So you can see that the reason behind the failure can be very different. Okay, now let's talk about the next big one, and this is the ecological theories of development. So there are two main camps. One is the ethological and evolution theories. And you can see that 
while they still kind of believe uh, in the importance of the environment, but they are focusing more on the grand context of evolution uh, history of our species. So and when it comes to the ethological and evolution theories, they view the children as inheritors of genetically based abilities and predispositions. We'll come to back to this later. And the other school of camp is another school of thought is the bio uh, ecological model. So they focus on the effects of the context on development, but they also really focus on the child's active role in selecting and influencing their own uh, environment, in other words. Uh, so they believe that the children's personality, temperament, abilities, intelligence really help them to choose their own environment. So this is very similar to um, Albert Bandera's um, reciprocal determinism, which we kind of describe a little bit. So they, uh, so they kind of thought that uh, what kind of things that are attracting the child and then, the, and then the child is going to go toward an environment that is more attractive to them. And therefore, it, this is kind of like a uh, self-attracting kind of a process to a certain environment. Or, and if they don't like the environment, they're going to make it a better environment, this kind of idea. All right, now let's talk about ethology. And this is the study of um, behavior within the evolutionary context. So this kind of attempts to understand the behavior in terms of the adaptive or survival value. And so the most famous case is uh, the study of um, imprinting that was done by Conrad Lawrence. So what he did is that he found that these the birds have this tendency well in this case geese uh, have this tendency to follow their mother after they um, broken out from the shell right and then so he did the experiment that he would actually um, be the first moving object that these um, infant geese see after um, they broken out from the shell and then he realized that now these geese will follow him around wherever he goes. Then he realized that, okay, they have identified him as their mother, okay? And so this goes to show that how important this imprinting process is when it comes to uh, the critical period in, in very early life. And then now humans, we do not actually imprint um, but we do have a very strong tendency to draw them to the, 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 the same similar species and, and also things that are kind of very similar to um, the process when they were in the womb. So, so for instance, the infants have the tendencies to orient to sound, taste, and smell familiar from their experience in the womb. So this is a predisposition that inclined them toward their own mother in order to kind of enhance uh, survival because they know that the mother will take care of them, right? Uh, another example of human behavior which um, the, with some sort of ethological perspective is really kind of like the play preferences in male versus females. For example, um, most boys that would prefer to play with like say cars, um, they would do more like action play uh, with like swords or guns, uh, things like that. Uh, where as opposed to girls, they would more prefer like dolls and then which are more conducive to uh, nurturing. Uh, they might play house uh, in Chinese, we say ban jia jia xiu, you know. And then these are more things that are um, kind of ready for uh, ready them uh, for later on development because um, guys are traditionally thought as the um, uh, the hunter for the family, and while the uh, the girls are more like to play the role of, of the nurturing part, uh, like kind of setting house that, that are more domestic. So you can see that these are the most, at, uh, as a whole, these gender differences can really um, promote the, the survival of the entire species. 
All right, now let's talk about evolutionary psychology. So similar to ethology, uh, evolutionary psychology focuses on the survival of the species through a natural selection and adaptation. So this is something that is very similar to the Dar Darwinian concept. Okay, so the basic idea is that the evolutionary um, history of our species, certain genes predispose individuals to behave in ways that solve in adaptive challenges that they faced. So basically, then these individuals were more likely to survive, mate, and reproduce, and passing along their genes to the offspring. And now one of the things I, I want to bring out is this is one of the most important adaptive um, features of the human species. And this really is what distinguishes us from um, other species is the large size of our brains. And then, but, but you, uh, so let's take a look at the correlation between the brain size on the y-axis and the duration in the juvenile years. Um, you can see that humans clearly, because our brain size is the largest, and we we spent a very long time in this uh, duration in juvenile years compared to other uh, animals, such as uh, the next smartest one, I guess, is the gorilla and the chimpanzee. Um, the amount of the time that they spend in the uh, juvenile period is a lot shorter compared to humans. Now, this really kind of um, tells us that as human uh, kind of evolved, the enlargement of our brain was made possible by birds um, occurring to like a more immature stage compared to like other animals. And this makes it that um, the parents need to take care of the children for a much longer period of time in order for these children to reach sexual maturity and then to pass on those genes. Okay. Now, what is the next piece of evidence? Uh, a lot of the uh, evolutionary psychologists have suggested the importance uh, the, of the role of the play. So this has to do with uh, this kind of like an evolved platform for learning. So they can kind of experiment with a situation with minimal consequences. So there is no consequences if you were to drop uh, the the doll on the floor, um, they won't die. Okay, you just you might just have a broken doll. There are very little minimal consequences for the species, and this is why um, girls and also some boys um, really like to uh, uh, imitate some real life situations later on if they were. So you can see that they were kind of pretend that they are a firefighter uh, for guys, um, and when they were kind of pre pretend that they are. Um, like something that they want to be in the future because this situation really has very minimal consequences for them and therefore uh, they can kind of get used to that idea later and they so they can kind of uh, decide if this is a goal I really want to have for life. The next thing I want to talk about is the, uh, is the parental in, um, investment theory. So what is the parental investment theory? So this is basically saying that um, this is a theory that basically stressed the evolutionary basis of many aspects of parental behavior, including the extensive investment parents make in their offspring. So the, they think that the primary source for the parents uh, in order for them to sacrifice is the drive to perpetuate or, or to pass on their genes onto the human gene pool. Okay, And this brings out a very dark side in the uh, parental investment theory, and that is the Cinderella effect. And we all know about Cinderella, right? So uh, basically her stepmother, it does not treat her very well just because she was not her um, a biological daughter. And you see this a lot in the uh, genetic fathers versus the stepfathers. And so on the y-axis, what we're seeing is the number of homicides victims per million um, that live with their stepfather. What well, that, that either live with their biological father or would live with their stepfather. And the x-axis that we're seeing is uh, age. Okay, and you can see that the stepfather really have this uh, tendency, or well, higher tendency, to really uh, do something that is much higher um, to to do some sort of harm to uh, a child that they did not give birth to. Okay, compared to um, the genetic fathers. 
So in other words, um, the this is kind of like human nature that they tend not to care, take care of someone else's kid. Okay, you see this a lot in um, in many cultures as well. The moment that uh, you see this in a lot of movies that so so it's things like the moment that um, the father found out that the child was not his, he either tried to kill the child or um, or stop caring for the child, right? Would leave the con would leave the family. So all of these are um, indicators that the parental investment theory within the evolutionary psychology may, may kind of be hinting that this is correct. Next, let's talk about the bioecological system or the biological model. So this is proposed by Yuri Brenner. And so this is kind of like a set of nested structures, very similar like Russian dolls. And within it, there are um, microsystem, mesosystem, exosystem, macro system and the last one is a chrono system okay so the model kind of looks this on the right so in the micro system you have um, basically just yourself okay and then the meso systems are the things that are more immediately apparent and that can directly impact you and that you can also impact and that are things like your parents and siblings um the re your religion your work uh, your your primary doctor, uh, things like school and technology use, all of these things are the things that are, are within the measles system. Now in the exosystem, these are things that are more extensive, that are uh, kind of like an outer ring. So these are things that can kind of more, that you have association and you can have, um, you can have like relations with them, but you it's not a necessary part that can either that can that can so they their uh, influence on you is more indirect. So you get things like families, uh, uh, friends of family, okay, your acquaintances or something like the mass media. You can either de decide to turn them turn them on or turn them off. Things like the school board, things like legal services. Um, or let's say your neighbors and things like that. So these are more like your exosystem. And on the outermost part, you get something like the macro system, okay? So these are the things like the laws, the country that you live in, uh, like all these subs, uh, subculture or your social class and things like that. So these are the ones that are influencing you uh, on a very large scale but then uh, as a whole they don't um they do really don't have like a direct impact on you you or your life so much okay and the last thing is the change in the person with the in uh, with a change of the environment over time so that is the the, the fifth one and that is the chrono system over here Okay, the things that I really liked about the bioecological model is that it really addresses many of our current life issues when it comes to a child's development. And so the first one is things like the child maltreatment, okay? Another thing is media, and I'll go into a lot of that later. And then another one is the social economical status. So all of these things that are really addressed very well by the bioecological model. Okay, now let's talk about uh, child maltreatment or child abuse. So it, this is when the parent or the caregiver, they um, either cause them some sort of physical injury, death, emotional harm, or risk of serious harm to a child. And of course, um, if there is there's some sort of neglect on the child that also falls onto the realm of child abuse. So what are some of the causes that can um, contribute to parents doing this inexcusable acts? So one is that the parents have low self-esteem and so therefore they kind of take it out their frustration of daily life onto a person who is, um, who cannot kind of stand stand up against them and that would be the child okay and also there's a lot of the time the parents with the low self-esteem uh, they will also have the inability to handle uh, everyday life frustration and stress really well 
and therefore they would just take out that frustration as a way of acting out on their child. Of, of course, this is not excusable for any kind of this um, child maltreatment. Uh, another reason is uh, they just have poor impulse control. Uh, they don't know when to kind of stop themselves from doing something that they that they're not supposed to do. And another big thing that can really contribute to this is drugs and alcohol. But I want to say that drugs and alcohol, they're not the main culprit, they just make things worse. They kind of uh, increases these, um, uh, this bad impulse control, okay? Now, what are some of the consequences that can actually cause uh, this uh, child abuse? Well, the consequences of this child abuse really is the child can over time have some issues with uh, anger, fear, sadness when they're kind of interacting with other people. Uh, now, I don't want to say that um, people who are introverted were like the people who are uh, child abused, but I just want to say that a lot of times the children who have been abused, they were more likely to take on a personality that is extremely introverted. Okay, and then they will um, try to uh, withdraw from many things that they may usually kind of try, a, a, a lot of other children would may, may usually find like pleasurable. And then this uh, makes them very vulnerable to like mental and physical health challenges. And then something that your book point out is that um, these children, these abused children, they are uh, much more likely than their peers to be diagnosed with a psychiatric disorder in adolescence or adulthood. But their, um, their disorder is also likely to um, develop earlier, be more severe, and be more uh, and be less less responsive to treatment. Okay, because and even after they are they have been cured of the disease, it's um, they they can really come back uh, more easily as well. Okay. And here on the right, what we're seeing is a figure on the y-axis we're seeing. This is the chance of one or more negative outcomes. Okay, this is in percentages. And the x-axis we're seeing is the number of maltreatment reports. You can see that these are very strongly correlated. So that the number of the, mal re uh, um, that the maltreatment really is very strongly correlated with uh, the negative outcomes, so which means that there is a direct relationship between um, the frequency of the child abuse and how un how um, negative outcomes is likely to be produced from that. Okay, now next let's talk about the effect of media on the children. And I want to pay a lot more attention on the media violence. And because you see that the medium violence is a real issue because the aggression in television, uh, in games, video games, and movies is really particularly concerning because it tends to be glamorized or trivialized, and particularly when the violence is per, um, perpetrated by the heroes, and you see that they, and then they came out triumphant, right? And then what happened is that this kind of teaches the children that it's okay to be violent. And so this is something that is not uh, something that is not a very good thing. Now, the exposure to media violence can have impact on four different ways. First of all, is the, uh, it kind of it teaches the children how to be violent, as you saw from the Bobo dolls earlier. Um, now, the second one is that viewing these uh, aggression activates the viewer's own aggressive thoughts, feelings, and tendencies. The third one is that these are things that are pretty arousing to the youth, okay? Now, when these things are arousing to the youth and then they have this heightened physiological arouse, that makes them more likely to react violently to um, things that right after being watched in films. And the last one is that this causes um, uh, let's say if you watch like these violent stuff very uh, over all over and over again and um, for a very long time, this is going to lead to some sort of emotional desensitization 
and in some very um, extreme degrees, it might even cause you to have the realization, which kind of makes you think that um, my aggression in real life is not real. But then I have to tell you that the damage that they provoked in other people are really real. And so this is something that uh, the medium violence can have a very negative impact on children. So this is why it's it's good to make sure that you have parental control on the stuff that your children uh, watch when they are little. Uh, because we talked about the importance of critical period, right? So you don't want them to start having these thoughts that these are okay. So after they have kind of passed that critical period, when they get to the point that they start to, can, they have a better distinguish, um, uh, they have better ability to distinguish what is correct and what is wrong, what is real, what is fake, you can kind of tell them these things don't happen in real life, whatever you're trying to see on TV. So this way they can, uh, they, they get to understand what behavior is acceptable in real life and what behavior are so-called kind of not real in game, video games or in movies or in TV shows. All right, the next thing I want to talk about is the social media. So the technology is now kind of play a very major role in adolescent social in, uh, relationships. So we all know that we use a lot of um, WeChat, we use a lot of, let's say, WhatsApp, um, uh, let's say, Line, Instant Messengers, uh, all of these stuff, um, in, you know, Instagram. Uh, Facebook and these all of these things now so this kind of makes them kind of compare themselves to their friends online but I have to say that these stuff that you are seeing online a lot of it has been glamour uh, glamorized and then just taking a picture and posting it online is easy okay it does not necessarily mean that something that, that really belongs to them and then so I can I can tell you um, picture can be deceiving as well, okay? So uh, another thing I wanna say is that while social media may um, depict less in the way of physical violence than other forms of media, there are always like hate speech that is going on on social media. And, and you can also see that there are often um, in, encounter things like racist, sexist, or uh, homophobic comments online. So this is also the idea of cyberbullying, okay? So uh, social media, uh, you want to kind of uh, make sure that who you invite your friends to be. And then I, I would not spend so much time on social media because uh, when you spend a lot of time watching other people's life, you kind of forget about your own life. Okay. The next thing I want to talk about is physical. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, so the next thing I want to talk about is physical inactivity. Okay. So one thing that you want to say is that child who is kind of glued to the screen, what happens is that they're not going to move too much, right? And therefore they're not exercising and uh, they're they're just watching this kind of stuff like all the time. And now it doesn't necessarily have to be the violence, but they're really allowing some sort of um, brainwashing. Because when you kind of think about it, when you're watching TV or you're watching like um, stuff that's online, you are just allowing someone else's thoughts to kind of program your thoughts, right? And then so what happened is that this kind of thought where you just kind of passively, you just kind of passively like um, sponging, uh, like absorbing information, uh, 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 like a bunch of information while kind of not producing your own thoughts. So what happened is that this physical inactivity and also your mental inactivity is, is going to have a very negative consequence on you. And on top of that, a lot of people eat junk food while they are, um, in front of the TV, right? So you see that all of these have some very bad um, negative consequences, um, not just on, on the mental health, but also on your physical health as well.
Okay, the last thing I want to talk about is uh, pornography. So you can see that this is a very serious concern for many, for many parents, is that their children exposure to pornography um, on television and also on the internet. Um, now, it could be some something like uh, an advertisement on the late night show. And, then, and of course, uh, you can see that a lot of people are also uh, concerned. And now you don't want the children to watch pornography uh, too early because this can have them becoming accepting of premarital or extramarital sex as well as premature sex. And none of these are very good thing because let's say um, premature sex um, before you, they have, let's say, uh, an accurate idea um, what um, things like the sexual uh, transmitted diseases are can really ruin their life or at least become something that is very negative in their experiences and that can really have a, a big issue on their later uh, love life. Right, so this is something that you don't want them to um, to develop too early. Now, pornography is not is something that is not great, and that is because it's kind of artificially boosting uh, the chemicals and the hormones in your body when it's not really needed. So. Um, uh, now, of course, as adults, uh, uh, like a lot of people watch pornography, um, I personally don't think this is something that is great. And that is because um, this kind of pollutes your mind. And you want to also want, and, and this also creates a lot of hormone imbalances and chemical imbalances in your body. And, and so it also increases uh, something called dopamine in your in your brain, and this is re somewhat rewarded to the um, to the motivation and reward. And so, what happens is that when you are watching pornography all the time or very often, this is going to be very uh, physically and mentally stimulating to uh, yourself, and this can really um, kind of decreases your uh, reward sensitivity to later. So this can make you um, procrastinate. This can make you um, have a less uh, drive to become successful. So uh, pornography is definitely something I, I don't recommend um, to uh, anybody, not just children, but also to uh, anybody. Okay, now let's talk about the socioeconomic status and development. Okay, now, so the poverty, as we said before, has a major negative impact on development. And this is because um, poverty is usually associated with a lot of neglect on the children. So let's say because the, the parents are poor and both parents have to work and they cannot afford a baby uh, babysitter or a caregiver to properly take care of the, the, the children. And on top of that, the amount of the nutrition as well as the type of the schooling that um, this um, um, impoverished, impoverished family can afford is not going to be very good um, compared to uh, like a, a richer family. Okay, but there is something I want to bring up and that's on the other side. And this has to do with growing up in a highly affluent family can also have a negative impact on the development as well. And they call this term affluenza, okay? So the affluent teens, um, they report like higher level of substance abuse than their peers, especially something like uh, alcohol um, because they can afford it, okay? And then so in one study that um, the affluent high school kids, um, they, they kind of reportedly um, remember that like, being drunk in the last month compared to um, the less affluent sample of high school students. Uh, now, peer envy is also especially common uh, among um, affluent teens, um, particularly among girls. So if you ever watch um, this, there was a very nice movie, uh, Mean Girls. If you ever watch that, uh, you can watch that. That this That's more like an affluent, um, rich, uh, 
style of living in, uh, in America. So you see this, um, the students will kind of always kind of compare um, themselves with like, their friends and say, how come he or she has a product and bag and I don't? And uh, how come, how come uh, he is driving a, um, a BMW while I am driving a Mazda? Well, actually, that won't be the case. That's more like, a, how come he is driving a Bentley? I am only driving a Porsche something like that. So you can see that there is going to be a lot of issues um, when it comes to the psychology, um, psychological challenges um, for these in, uh, affluent children, okay? You can see that their likelihood is that they can also have higher anxiety and depression because uh, unfortunately there is something that people can not have and just want more and then they feel that life is unfair and of course um, if you can you just want to scream at these people and say that if you just live one day in like a middle class's life you will not complain anything about your life basically right Okay, so I'm sorry today's lecture was a little long, but you have heard from many school of thoughts that basically came from many different um, perspectives about how society and how social aspect can really uh, change the way that a person develops and you heard from many um, thoughts. So I want to bring out this point and that is for tomorrow's discussion and and that is are we being conditioned or even conformed by societal standards about our decisions so when when, when we do follow our own uh, desires rather than desire of others people and how does the culture that you grow up in play a role in your decision so in other words i really want to talk about uh, this idea of active child and, and social conditioning and kind of see like how do you so you can kind of bring this up from many um, points many many philosophers points and I just want to see how you guys think about this aspect okay I'll see you guys tomorrow